How to talk about compulsion and control in Demotic. I'm extremely grateful to Christ College and to Alex Lotyanov, the organiser of this third Lady Wallace Budge Egyptology Symposium, for the opportunity to join in the discussion of a topic that is relevant to numerous aspects of ancient Egyptian society and culture. The overall aim of this contribution is to explore what can be said about Egyptian attitudes to the theme of the symposium, compulsion and control, on the basis of the speaker's current research areas, exploiting the evidence of demotic letters and more especially of demotic narratives. A starting point will be the expressions in demotic for the exercise of manipulation and coercion. The discussion of these, which is here severely abridged, as I hope is most appropriate to a spoken presentation, will be at a more general level than what is normally regarded as lexicography or even lexicology, and makes no claim to emulate proper work in linguistics, even though related investigations could be done within the field of pragmatics. Because of my own special interests in the approaches used within narratology, and in view of my current work on the exploitation of emotions in textual material, I will discuss what lights these can throw upon our topic. I hope to investigate how Egyptian storytellers use the notion of compulsion and the emotions aroused by it as a device in narrative, and to reflect upon whether or not this could have been a significant theme within the literature. First, some very brief comments on the nature of Demotic. By the nature of this symposium, not all those taking part will be familiar with Demotic narratives and so may welcome some background information. Others, however, may actually be Demotists. Therefore, I will try to steer a middle course and make just a few points relevant to my whole topic both by way of introduction and in the course of the discussion. The demotic script was first standardised in the Sayite period, that is, somewhat before the middle of the first millennium before, before the Common Era, for the recording of documentary material to serve the interests of the Egyptian elite. It may very quickly have begun to be employed to write down literary texts, although we have hardly any firm evidence for this until the 4th century before the Common Era. By then, Egypt had already had a history of written literature stretching over a span of a millennium and a half. Although the survival of manuscripts over these centuries is patchy, considerable continuities can be seen, both in form and content, right through into the Demotic period. Narrative literature in Demotic was alive for, at the very least, six centuries. Demotic is also the name of the stage of the Egyptian language found in the literature. It is generally argued to embody a formal register of language originally suited to legal documents. Demotic stories no doubt are somehow linked to traditions and practices of oral storytelling but the tradition we can observe is not only, obviously, written, but firmly based in written culture. The social context of the literature lay in the Egyptian temples. In some sense, until the arrival of Alexander the Great, the liter literate community virtually comprised the Egyptian priesthood. Thereafter, it seems clear that those who maintained literate culture in Demotic were confined to the milieu of the Egyptian temples. It may be as well to admit frankly that the Demotic narratives are not the easiest place to look for material relevant to my topic. First, some stories from earlier periods offer more scope for the discussion of compulsion and control. However, the demotic material presents a larger corpus so that it is easier to draw representative conclusions. 
and it would be awkward and even risky to try to combine evidence from a date range of over a millennium. Any conclusions would need a great deal of justification and qualification. Secondly, more explicit treatments of compulsion can be found in the Demotic Wisdom texts, and perhaps to an even greater extent in earlier wisdom literature. The wisdom texts, however, must by their nature take a prejudiced and self-conscious approach to the topic. It can be more rewarding to see what the narratives can reveal in passing when they are not deliberately addressing the issue. Thus I suggest that concentrating upon demotic narratives presents both a challenge and an opportunity. Demotic does not lack vocabulary for to compel, compulsion. The obvious word is heter, and its range of meanings is clear. I'll just show you the impressive extent of the entries in the Chicago Demotic Dictionary for the ver verb and noun. I'll just pass through the page. However, it is not a term that is much used in narrative texts, and almost the same could be said about the corpus of letters in Demotic. Of course, that does not in any way mean that the concept is lacking in the texts. It may be expressed in quite other ways, or, rather commonly, implied. So the position is rather similar to that of the terminology for the emotions in narratives and in personal letters. The emotions, too, are more often implied than explicitly stated. I have on previous occasions discussed the extremely common use in demotic stories of expressions for making someone do something, having something done. Unsurprisingly, these can play a significant role in the way in which a narrative is constructed and given cohesion. Of course, in themselves, such idioms hardly convey compulsion in any strong sense. These idioms for causing something to happen have a long history in the Egyptian language. Their use grew over time. By the Coptic stage of the language, they were employed widely in fossilised grammaticalized forms, traditionally terms of finalis and causative infinitive, in which the cause element had become completely obscured and was surely never recognized by speech speakers of the language. I would suggest that this stage had not been reached in Demotic. A simple use would be when a character in a story makes a series of events happen. They cause other people to do things. The advantage of this kind of expression for the storyteller is that a sequence of happenings and actions, perhaps carried out by several characters, can be narrated while the grammatical subject in the passage remains unchanged. So it is the main character who continues to do things. This makes the story easier to follow than if the subject of the verbs swapped and changed. Also, it may suit the narrator if the chief character's agency is emphasised and if they remain the centre of attention. Here is a relatively simple example from the first settler story. Here, Nonefakapta and his wife Yehwere, who are the we of the extract, see to the burial of their drowned son Merib. We returned to Coptos with him. We caused him to be carried to the embalming shop. We caused them to attend to him. We caused them to embalm him in the style of a superior, elite person. We caused him to repose in his sarcophagus in the necropolis of Coptos. A more convoluted example from a fragmentary Setna story housed in Copenhagen. I hear it presented in a deliberately over-literal translation.
Setna calls to one of his assistants, calls that they cause the herald to proclaim in Abydos. Everyone who belongs to Pethes' household calls them to come into the temple, because Pharaoh has caused that I, uh, it's referring to Setna, should bestow incense and offerings, which he has granted to Pethes and all his household. This involves the luring of the family and household of the villain of the story, Petese, into the temple so that they may readily be imprisoned and executed. As elsewhere in the Setna cycle, it seems to be assumed that because Setna is a son of the king, Ramesses II, he can of course order action of this brutal kind without further formality. Uh, this is a theme I shall return to shortly. I turn now to asking if we can say what the texts are about. For present day literatures it is of course commonplace to try to identify what a work of fiction is about, what it is getting at, what its main theme is. Notoriously readers may sometimes not agree with what the author may they think their book is about, but established authors usually have a definite idea as to the chief theme they are trying to put across. And this often nowadays is thought to be necessary in order for a book to be taken seriously as a work of literature. For demotic narrative literature, we do not have the opinions of the authors to take into account, nor those of the readers. As a separate in consideration, the impersonal narrators of texts scarcely ever comment on the action. However, there are ways in which we can try to answer the question. Themes may be highlighted by various means, for example, by the use of repetition, by the use of language that implies emphasis or emotion, and by the placing of ideas at key moments in the plot. Where we can recognise a group of texts that are related to one another, we can try to see whether there are themes that recur and therefore must be deliberately being explored. In fact, it is useful to see genre and subgenres within the literature. Most notably, there are texts that celebrate military figures and texts that celebrate magicians. Within these there are subgenres, some of which form what have tended to be termed cycles of stories. Cycles have been recognised for over a century as a typical feature of demotic narrative, definitely as early as Wilhelm Spiegelberg and F. Llewellyn Griffith held a similar view. Those that have been long familiar are the Eneros cycle and the Setna Khamwese cycle, and it may be that others will come to be acknowledged in the future. Indeed, for some time, discussion of the Roman period literature was rather over-dominated by the notion of cycles of stories. Such cycles are a common feature of literatures of many times and in many cultures and it is occasionally argued that they proliferate at a certain stage in the development of a literary tradition. Another suggestion is that cycles are typically late developments in which stories that have had a previous independent existence are reappropriated to fit into a flourishing genre. Thus the main characters or characters may take on an entirely new identity. In the case of both the recognised demotic cycles, the major characters include real persons, and real persons who lived well in the past. In the Eneros cycle, the general understanding now is that many of the major characters are based upon, or at least recall, actual historical figures from the 7th century before the Common Era. It is not at all surprising if, for example, subsidiary characters are given arbitrary and even unstable names, 
This is standard in the later epic and romance traditions. In the Setna cycle, Setna Khamwezi himself is not only plainly based upon the real figure of the fourth son of Ramesses II of the New Kingdom, but also re reveals some appreciation of the actual activities of the historical Khamwezi. The point has been well made by more than one scholar, but when stories are elaborated around a real historical figure, that process tends to begin not too long after their lifetime. Indeed, in the modern world, there are well-known cases of fictitious adventures circulating in print while their heroes are still alive. The Setna stories appear, as far as our surviving evidence runs, to follow as their core a remarkably set pattern. Setna enters the tomb of a powerful nobleman of the past with powers which we insist upon calling magic and learns from him of a misfortune or injustice that he had suffered which Setna can still put to rights in the real world. Encounters with a mummy in their tomb form a theme already known from stories of the New Kingdom. The Setna cycle seems, however, to add an extra dimension of seriousness. The stories, especially that known as the first Setna, have been studied for their humour, which is undoubtedly a feature, and Setna has even been seen as an anti-hero or comic figure. However, they also raise moral issues beyond the tradition from which they derive. A much discussed passage in the first Setna story concerns an indisputably high-handed piece of behaviour by Setna. He is instantly infatuated by a beautiful woman he encounters in public, and immediately, in public, he sends his servant to ask her to sleep with him. The details of the phraseology are unfortunately debatable, but unquestionably, in the first place, he flaunts his rank and threatens to abduct the woman if she will not agree, and, in the second place, his behaviour is represented as shocking. This is a turning point in the story, and ultimately Setna is humiliated as a result. There is therefore a strong case for suggesting that misuse of arbitrary power is a theme of the whole composition. Criticisms of arbitrary power can be seen in texts that have no kind of link with the Setna cycle. Indeed, Papyrus Vendier is not a demotic text, being in hieratic script, but it is written in a form of language close to demotic, and may stem from a date about the, about the beginning of the period of demotic literature. The beginning, at least, of the plot is clear. The king, Pharaoh Sasobek, learns from his court magicians, who play a villainous role, that he is doomed to die within seven days. The chief character of the story, the general Merire, agrees to die in order to go to the other world and beg a longer life for the king. Merire entrusts his wife and son to the king. He does succeed in gaining extra life for the king but then learns that the king himself has stolen his wife and killed his son. He sends a magical figure from the other world to exact vengeance, evidently with some success, although as the surviving text becomes more fragmentary and breaks off, it becomes obvious to us that the story is entering new complications at which we can only guess. But despite this, it is plausible that abuse of power is a major theme in the text as a whole. So I hope I have been able to hint at some ways in which it is possible to link details of phraseology in demotic narratives with the overall themes of the texts which they are keen to highlight. And I thank you for your attention.